Pippin Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello students and welcome back to the second lecture on environmental issues. In the first lecture, we have seen in-depth discussion on air pollution, water pollution and part of solid waste management. Continuing with the solid waste management, we have another type of menace that has caught up in recent times and that is electronic waste or e-waste. All of us today use a phone. We use various electronic gadgets. What do we do once this phone is old and we don't need it anymore? We just keep it, maybe we give it back to the shop or we just discard it. Where do all these electronic items land up? Ultimately, they are all thrash. And this electronic waste or e-waste is posing a great threat to the ecosystems. And hence, we have to do something about them in order to reduce the pollution caused by this electronic waste. E-waste can be easily recycled because the e-waste, some of them which are irreparable electronic goods are usually buried in landfill sites or incinerated which are a source of pollution. But instead, these electronic goods have some important metals in them metals can be extracted and these electronic waste can be recycled. Most of the e-waste that is generated in the developed countries is sent to uh, developing countries such as China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc. where metals such as copper, iron, nickel, tin, aluminium and sometimes even gold are obtained from these circuits of the electronic goods. Now the problem with recycling e-waste is that the workers who work with this e-waste are very often exposed to toxic chemicals because very often they dismantle these boards and circuits with their bare hands and in doing so they come in contact with leak batteries and acids and things like that which can cause direct harm to the handler. So we need good solutions where we have proper recycling units where this electronic waste can be segregated and in a scientific manner the useful items from this waste can be removed and recycled thus reducing the load on the sanitary landfill sites. Let us now move on to a case study of plastic waste management. <clears throat> Very often the grocery bag that we buy, it goes into the trash bin. But now let us look at how these bags and other plastic waste was converted into a state highway or roads that were made from plastic. An Indian scientist Rajagopalan Vasudevan invented a method to make roads from plastic waste. For this invention, he was awarded the Padma Shri and is, he is also nicknamed as the Plastic Man of India. Taking insights from Vasudevan, a plastic sack manufacturer, uh, Mr. K. Ahmad Khan, along with his brother, used his plastic sack making company called KK Plastics to gather plastic waste from the city of Bangalore. And he used this plastic waste, shredded it and made it into a fine powder called as polyblend. And he used it to make roads. Let us see how he did it. He associated with the RV College of Engineering and he devised this method of using three materials. One, the aggregate, that is the normal concrete and other dust particles which are used to make roads. The second thing he used was a substance called as bitumen, which is a substance used for binding the concrete mixture and it has an added advantage that bitumen when mixed with polybland, which is a powder of waste plastic, helps in repelling water. And these three things were mixed together and used to lay roads. Such roads 
that were made from the aggregate bitumen and polybland which is a waste plastic that has been shredded had a longer life compared to other roads. The reason being that the bitumen with polybland acted as a water repelling material. In a country like India where we receive plenty of rainfall, the rain water causes uh, some harmful effect on the road and we see the road degrading. To avoid this, this bitumen and polyblend helped to repel away the water and as a result it gave longevity to the roads. And hence, laying plastic roads became a solution for plastic waste. Plastic waste began to be collected from the city of Bangalore to be converted into state highways and a large stretch of road was laid using this polyblend. The plan is further to take this technology to other states of India and to convert the plastic waste, recycle it into and use it in making longer lasting plastic roads. Look at this picture, it speaks volumes. When a turtle moves on the beach, it leaves imprints like this. When birds move on the beach, they leave imprints like this. And when humans move on the beach, they leave back trash. So it is a responsibility on us human beings. We need to learn from other organisms that are co-inhabitants of this earth. We have a responsibility to leave it, leave the environment clean and to avoid solid waste pollution which we are so used to and make this place a better and a cleaner place for other inhabitants along with human beings. We now move on to the next type of pollution that is agrochemicals. Agrochemicals are all the chemicals that are used for agricultural practices. This will include chemical pesticides, chemical insecticides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers which, can, which are used to either protect the crops from harmful pests or they can be used as enhancers to, to, for a better yield of the agricultural produce. Let us see what are the ill effects of these <coughs> uh, agrochemicals when they are used in an ecosystem. The application of a pesticide, let us take this as an example. This pesticide when used on a crop, it leaches down into the groundwater and very often pollutes the groundwater. From the ground, it affects the flora, the microbes of the soil. It can cause indiscriminate death of the flora and fauna of the soil. This uh, chemical is also used as uptake by plants. The plants will assimilate in, it into the body and show some harmful effects such as falling off the leaves prematurely. It also can vaporize and get into the atmosphere, mix with rain and cause acid rain and several other problems. Besides this, the pollutant here, in this case the agrochemical, can get into the food chain. It can get bioaccumulated and it can get biomagnified and ultimately through the food that we eat, it can come to human beings. It can cause weakened bones, it can cause irritational uh, symptoms in the gut and other uh, related problems in human beings along with other uh, organisms, plants, animals and microbes. So this inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides that are used, they are used to remove something which is not good for the agricultural pro product, for example pest. But the problem is that these uh, chemicals are indiscriminate. They will take care of the target organism as well as the non-target organisms. For example, if you are using a pesticide to take care of a particular locust or some grasshopper which is feeding on the uh, seed grains that you have grown, it will also end up killing other useful insects like bees. Bees who are the natural pollinators of the plant, if the plant is insect pollinated. If there is no pollination due to the loss of the bee, due to indiscriminate use of chemical pesticide, it could definitely reduce the yield of that crop. Therefore, chemical fertilizers used rampantly are causing a lot of havoc in the ecosystem. 
chemical fertilizers also get washed away by the streams and the water and it gets into the nearby pond or lake thus causing eutrophication in those water bodies. Eutrophication phenomenon we have just discussed in the previous lecture. What is the solution to this? We need to move on towards biological pest control. We need to move on to biological methods of enhancing the produce of our farmlands. And this was shown by a person called as Ramesh Chandra Dhagar, a man in Sonipat, Haryana, a farmer who has shown with example how you can create a sustainable village where you can integrate different types of practices where the waste of one technique can act like a fertilizer, manure or an important input for another agricultural practice. Let us just look at this model that was presented by this person Ramesh Chandra Dhagar. This is an ideal village which is self-sustainable. They have mechanisms to harvest rainwater so that this water can be used for domestic as well as agricultural purposes. So the homes there can use this water and they can also be used for agricultural practices. This village also has um, animals like cattle who are used for agricultural activities and the dung that is availed from these animals can be used to make valuable biogas. This biogas can be used to run the machinery that is used in the agricultural practices. It can also be used in the homes that are there in that village. There will be also other practices such as beekeeping. So when you keep bees, what we call as apiculture, we get valuable honey. There is an added advantage to beekeeping. The bees will move into your fields which are nearby and pollinate them. Besides that, the, the fodder that is available after harvest can be used to feed other animals, poultry animals, other animals that can be fed upon with this fodder and also the, the food grains that are produced can be used for human consumption. This sustainable idea by Ramesh Chandra Dagar was extensively used in the state of Haryana and they have formed the Haryana Kisan Welfare Club which has more than 5000 uh, farmers as members and they use these sustainable methods where the waste from one practice can be used as an important input for another practice practice. As a result, this integrated farming reduces very few chemical pollutants. They are not dependent on chemicals. It is an organic farming practice. There are no pollutants released. There are no waste released. And so it is like a zero waste industry which is self-sustainable and uh, non-polluting to the environment. This model needs to be emulated by other farmers in an agricultural country like India. We move on now to the next type of pollution that is caused by radioactive substances. Now what is radioactivity? Ro radioactivity is a property exhibited by certain types of matter that emit energy. This energy from the radioactive substance can be emitted as particulates or they can be, it can be emitted as rays. For example, a radioactive substance can emit alpha particle, a beta particle and gamma rays. These gamma rays have very high penetration power and these are the ones which are the lethal rays that can cause radioactive pollution. But why do we need radioactive substances? For what purpose do we use them in nature? Radioactive substances are used to study living organisms. They are used treatment and diagnosis in the field of medicine. They are used for irradiation, radioisotopes are used for irradiation in agricultural practices. Besides that, one of the widespread use of radioactive material is in generation of power. We have thermal power plants which run on radioactive fuel. Very often elements like uranium, radium, thorium, cobalt, polonium and cesium are used as fuel in um, thermal power plants. Uh, 
these uh, power plants will use the phenomenon of nuclear fission where a particle when bombards a particle of radioactive substance there is fission that is created that is splitting of that radioactive molecule which releases tremendous amount of energy this energy is used in power generation stations to run large turbines and to uh, create electricity now after the fuel is spent the radioactive fuel like uranium when it is spent the challenge is to treat it and dispose it because although it is spent fuel this spent fuel will still be having the potency to release gamma radiations and hence disposing the waste in a scientific manner is the big challenge the effects of radioactive radiation let us look at some of them very strong radiations if a person is exposed to very strong radiations from radioactive substances it can lead to death weak radiation can lead to headache vomiting diarrhea long term exposure people working in radioactive with radioactive substances long over a long term can suffer from mutations uh, causing different types of cancers pregnant women can be uh, uh, if they are uh, exposed to radioactive substances the baby that they are carrying could be uh, hit with certain types of deformities radioactive damage uh, leakage accidental leakage can lead to damage of the ecosystem two great challenges when we use radioactive fuel there are two great challenges one is to prevent accidental leakage and second is to store the radioactive waste the first problem that is accidental leakage we have examples in history where in spite of taking stringent precautions there were accidental leakages like that what happened in chernobyl in russia where one of the reactor had a overload of the fuel that was the radioactive fuel uranium and there was massive blast uh, killing several people and the uh, effects of the radiation in the environment can be felt till today because children are still born with deformities due to these uh, damaging radiations that are causing mutations in the at the genetic level and that are heritable changes and hence even today children are born with deformities another accident was uh, in the 3 mile island at pennsylvania in the usa where one of the reactor reactor number 2 there was a failure in the cooling system and as a result there was a blast the government sources said that there was no much loss to life and the reactor continued for around 4 decades and 2019 it was shut down after around 4 decades of the accident still it was running it was closed down last year so accidental leakages can happen and that is one of the threat uh, when dealing with radioactive fuels the second is the storage part of it how do we store the spent up fuel from the uh, uh, nuclear power generating stations once the fuel is used up and it is no longer fit for generation of electricity it has to be disposed in a scientific manner now how do we dispose it why is it challenging it is challenging because although it is spent fuel still it has ability to release gamma radiation and this gamma radiation you can see in the diagram here it can easily penetrate into tissues into aluminum containers uh, even penetrate concrete walls the only substance that can block the gamma radiation is lead and hence the spent fuel radioactive fuel can be stored in lead containers and then buried deep down into the ground uh, beyond 500 meters deep into the ground and this is a scientific way of disposing of the radioactive waste however even this method is not full proof and hence sites where such radioactive material is disposed people living in the vicinity are always fearful and they are always objecting to this kind of activity because it is life threatening and if not properly disposed radioactive waste can cause havoc in the ecosystem and the organisms that live in that ecosystem 
We now move to the greenhouse effect and global warming. In one of the introductory slides of my first lecture, I had said that we are going to talk about this in detail. Let us now look at what is the greenhouse effect. I am sure at some point or the other you might have uh, been in a car, in a closed car where all the <coughs> glasses have been rolled up and the car is placed in a sunny area. After a while you start feeling very hot in the car. In fact, the temperature inside the car is much higher than if you would step out directly in the sun. This is because the solar radiation once it has got into the car, it heats up the environment and the object inside and infrared radiations begin to be emitted from the car. These radiations are trapped inside the car, they are not allowed to escape out, thus increasing the temperature of the car. This is something very similar that happens in glass houses that are built for growing crops, especially in colder areas. When the, the environmental ambient temperature is very cold, the plants can be grown inside a glass house where the glass creates a greenhouse effect by not allowing the infrared component that is the heat component to escape out. A similar thing happens in nature. In nature, the earth has a layer of atmosphere surrounding it. Now when the solar radiation that is the electromagnetic spectrum enters the uh, earth's atmosphere, it heats up the earth and the heated earth starts radiating some heat from it that is infrared rays. These infrared radiations are uh, some of them escape out of the atmosphere into the stratosphere and beyond, but some of the infrared radiations are uh, blocked by the greenhouse gases. The greenhouse, common greenhouse gases uh, are methane, carbon dioxide, etc. Carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas as you can see in this pie chart. Carbon dioxide blocks the IR component and the heat is trapped in the atmosphere. This phenomenon is called greenhouse effect. This is a very important phenomenon for the life to exist on earth because if it was not for the greenhouse effect, the earth's temperature would have been a freezing minus 18 degree centigrade. Today, the average temperature of the earth is plus or minus 15 degree centigrade and this is because of the greenhouse effect. So where is the problem? The problem is in the levels of carbon emissions. Today, human activities have in, are increasing the carbon emissions drastically. There is a huge rise of carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere. As a result, more and more heat gets trapped inside, more than what is required and this is called as global warming. Due to the increase in the greenhouse gases, the green effect is much more that is heating up of the earth is much more than what is normally required and this is leading to another phenomenon called as global warming. Overheating of the earth due to the greenhouse effect is called as global warming. During the past century the temperature of the earth has increased by 0.6 degree centigrade and that has been mostly during the last three decades because one thing human population is increasing and human activities are also increasing activities that release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are also increasing. If you look at this pie chart you can see the contribution of various countries to the greenhouse greenhouse gases. India and South Asia contribute around 7% of the greenhouse gases and we need to control this. All the countries together we need to control this. If not, the temperature of the earth is further going to increase. This graph shows you how the levels of carbon dioxide are constantly increasing. Data right from 1955 to the year 2000 shows a drastic rise in the levels of carbon dioxide. Values are in parts per million. And you can see that 2019 had the highest level of carbon emissions. 
what does it mean in terms of global average temperature you can see that the global average temperature is also on the rise 2019 was one of the warmest year of the uh, century and we can see that it is still going to increase if we do not control the carbon emissions what are the impacts of this rise in temperature what does it what are going to be the effects of global warming in other words there are going to be effects like the el nino effects el nino effect is an abnormal weather pattern that we see that is caused due to the warming of the pacific waters the pacific ocean which is near the equator heats up and alters the air currents the wind currents which directly affect storms hurricanes etc and the el nino effect is seen in uh, various countries nearby Uh, and el nino years repeat every 3 to 5 uh, years or 6 years and now the el nino effect is repeating at a very fast rate because the human activities of releasing greenhouse gases are also constantly on the rise besides this uh, green the global warming uh, causes melting of the glaciers the glaciers which are the source of the fresh water are constantly melting and this melting leads to an increase in the sea level on an average the sea level along the indian coast is considered to be rising by 1.70 mm every year that means over the past 50 years the sea level on the uh, southern south part of india the coastline on the east and west coast of india has risen by 8.5 cm what does it mean it means that if we continue to um, have such levels increasing uh, as per the united nations report cities like goa bombay kolkata will be sinking very soon if you take some island countries you take the republic of fiji the seychelles solomon islands the galapagos island maldives cape verde and many more island countries are sinking by the day because the sea level is constantly rising and as a result these countries one day if we do not control our carbon emissions may be lost forever now how can we stop global warming what can you and i do what can world leaders do what can everybody do to stop global warming a simple solution is reuse reduce and recycle the three r's can help in re reducing uh, the levels of carbon emissions and thus help in reducing global warming we can reduce the use of fossil fuels we we can use more efficient fuels like compressed natural gas uh, so that we can ha have less pollutants less carbon emissions uh, in the atmosphere we can plant more trees Uh, on an average i told you earlier also a fully grown tree if it has been living for 40 years would have sequestered or fixed 1 ton of carbon dioxide you can imagine the magnitude of carbon uh, that we are generating on one hand and on the other hand we are cutting down trees and hence there is nothing to absorb this carbon dioxide so one simple solution we can do is plant more trees we can reduce deforestation we can slow down the growth of human population international initiatives are also being taken to uh, by world leaders to control greenhouse gases that brings us to the next topic that is ozone depletion in the stratosphere what is ozone if you look at the earth the earth is surrounded with the atmosphere and which is a mixture of gases and other substances and one of the layer in the stratosphere is the ozone layer the ozone layer is measured in a unit called as dobson unit and on an average normal healthy ozone layer will be around 300 dobson unit and this 300 dobson unit if you would like to know it would be around 3 mm uh, uh, in diameter that is 3 mm if you stack two coins together that will be around 3 mm this layer of ozone surrounding the earth 
acts like an umbrella to shield us from harmful ultraviolet radiations, especially the UVB type of radiations which have tremendous amount of energy and which can act on organic on biomolecules such as proteins and DNA and cause harmful effects like mutations and cause um, a, a series of problems in humans which we will see at a little later stage. What is the problem related to ozone? In nature, we see that ozone is constantly formed and, and uh, it, is, it is forming, the ozone is formed and oxygen is formed. So, it keeps converting from oxygen to ozone, ozone to oxygen. If you see, nascent oxygen binds to a molecule of oxygen and creates ozone. At the same time, ozone splits into oxygen and nascent oxygen and that is the uh, breakdown of the ozone. This process is occurring, in the production and destruction of ozone is occurring at a very balanced rate in nature such that normal levels of ozone are maintained. However, due to human activities, due to human activities such as release of chlorofluorocarbons which are substances which are used as um, uh, in, in air conditioners, in refrigerators as refrigerants, aerosol spray, uh, sprays and making plastic foams. We have got these chlorofluorocarbons which are being constantly released into the atmosphere. What is the problem caused by chlorofluorocarbons? Chlorofluorocarbons, mainly chlorine that is a component of the chlorofluorocarbons acts like a catalyst to enhance the rate of reaction for destruction of ozone. That is, it acts like a catalyst to bring about the conversion of ozone into chlorine monoxide and oxygen. This chlorine monoxide later dissociate into an oxygen atom and chlorine. That means the catalyst is now available, it does not spend itself but it is now available to catalyze another ozone destruction reaction. That means all the chlorofluorocarbons that we are releasing into the atmosphere, they are, they are rising up higher to the uh, layer of the ozone and constantly destroying the ozone. And the bad part is that the chlorofluorocarbon does not get exhausted. It merely acts like a catalyst such as chlorine which is catalyzing the breakdown reaction of ozone and thus leading to constant depletion of the ozone layer. If you see these two images, one image is taken in 1979 over Antarctica, the frozen continent and the second image is taken in 2013. You can clearly see this blue color, uh, colored area which is representing the ozone hole that is de highly depleted ozone over Antarctica which is called as the ozone hole. This happens because in the winter months the ozone, um, the, the chlorofluorocarbons accumulate and when spring comes they begin the catalysis reaction and ozone is drastically depleted. So due to human activities over these years you can see here how healthy the ozone is around 220 Dobson units. It has drastically reduced to 100 Dobson unit which is creating a massive hole over Antarctica. What does it mean? A depleted ozone in the stratosphere will not be able to shield us from the harmful UVB type of radiations. As a result, these radiations with short wavelengths will enter the Earth's atmosphere and affect us directly. They can cause mutation of DNA and hence we can suffer from different types of skin cancers, different abnormal skin cells that can appear on our body. They can also cause cataract that is clouding of the lens of the eye. They can, uh, the harmful UVB radiations can affect the cornea of the eye causing a rare kind of illness of the eye called as slow blind, uh, snow blindness cataract which hampers vision in humans. 
to control the ozone uh, destruction world leaders met in montreal canada and signed a treaty called as the montreal protocol and this treaty was an international treaty that was signed on the 16th of september 1987 and hence every 16th of september a few days ago ozone day was celebrated in the year 2020 which commemorates the year of ozone to protect the ozone layer with the theme ozone for life we celebrated the ozone day and we renewed our promise as per the montreal protocol to reduce the use of chlorofluorocarbons and protect the ozone layer which acts like an umbrella to protect us from the harmful uv b kind of radiations that are coming from the sun the next issue that we are faced with is degradation by improper resource utilization and maintenance under this topic we are going to look at two phenomenon one is desertification and second is water logging and salinity now the when we do not utilize our land resource water resource properly it leads to several problems one of the problem that we face due to improper utilization and due to human activities such as over cultivation deforestation grazing and poor irrigation it leads to soil erosion it leads to parts of the land being converted into arid or desert like areas small small patches of desert like areas merge together to form large deserts or arid condition this leads to a phenomenon called as desertification in the picture if you can see the uh, you can see parts of the amazon forest being cleared for human activities such as agriculture growing fodder crops etc and that has led to the large scale desertification of the once lush green amazon rain forest the second problem due to improper utilization of resource is water logging and soil salinity logging of water flooding of land with water is a reality for most of us who live in the cities when the monsoon come there is no proper drainage system in place places are overpopulated houses and concrete structures are on the rise as a result water gets logged on the land when water is held up on the land it brings up or precipitates the dissolved salts of the soil which come and form a thin crust on the top layer of the soil now this thin crust of salts increases the salinity of the soil and this increased salinity leads to some detrimental effects on the plants that grow there so ultimately life gets affected plants get affected productivity of that ecosystem gets drastically reduced due to this salinity increase due to water logging of that particular place that brings us to a very important topic that is deforestation the amazon rain forest which is called as the lungs of the earth is being the forest is being cut down trees are being cut down right now as you and i speak the reason for this being human activities mahatma gandhi once said what are, what we are doing to the forests of the world is but a mirror reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another cutting down a tree is reducing our life span that is human beings our own activities are leading to our own downfall if we look at the years from 1990 to 2015 the world lost about 129 million hectares of forest uh, uh, if you look at the amazon alone if you see the national forest policy by india in 1988 india has recommended a 33% forest cover for the plains and 67% forest percent forest cover for the hilly areas but what is the reality today in india we have only 19.4% cover of forest 
which was around 30% at the beginning of the 20th century. Today, human activities has drastically reduced this forest and um, uh, human activities such as um, uh, clearing of the forest land for agricultural practices, for housing, etc. has reduced the forest cover and in, in the bargain we are causing desertification of the land. One of the reason, there are many reasons for deforestation. One of the reason that is uh, for deforestation is conversion of forest land into agricultural land. Let us take an example from our own country. In, the, uh, in, in certain parts of India, especially the northeastern states, a particular practice was very common, which was called as slash and burn agriculture or zoom cultivation. According to this practice, a hilly area was selected which had thick layer of forest. This forest patch would be cut down and trees from there that were cut down were burnt. After burning that patch, the ash was used to increase the fertility of that particular soil. Thereafter, the native people would take up this patch for agricultural practice. They would grow some crops over there and they would uh, use the yield for their survival. This was a very sustainable practice because after clearing a patch and using it for agriculture, these tribal people would move to another part of the hill and allow enough time for this cut down patch to replenish itself. However, due to more rampant human activities, not enough time was given for replenishment of that particular cleared forest patch. This led to more and more forest area being cut and burned and being brought under agricultural practices. And so, June cultivation became one of the major reasons for deforestation in a, in a country like India. The consequences of deforestation could be an increase in the carbon dioxide. Trees use up the carbon dioxide for the process of photosynthesis. They fix the CO2 or sequester the CO2 and give us valuable oxygen. If trees are cut, the levels of carbon will be very high in the atmosphere causing effects such as greenhouse effect and global warming. Besides that, when you cut down a tree, you lose a lot of biodiversity. There could be microbes, insects, birds, mammals that are living on that tree. And when you cut down a tree, all these organisms are rendered homeless. When you cut down large patches of tree, you can imagine what happens to these animals. Recently, there were fires, forest fires in California, in Australia that led to mass destruction of forests and we have seen images how the uh, animals also got affected due to the loss of their natural habitat. Deforestation also disturbs the hydrological cycle, that is the cycle of rain. We know that if there is more forest cover, we get more rain. Less forest cover, less rain. So if there are no plants, if there is no vegetation, we will not receive enough amount of rain that will lead to droughts, that will lead to famines and human beings also will be drastically affected by lack of rain. Lastly, there will be soil erosion and desertification. We know that the roots of the plants and trees hold the soil together. If trees are cut, when the water comes, when there is a runoff, there will be easy soil erosion and land will be degraded and that will further lead to desertification of that particular land. What is the solution? Reforestation programs, the, uh, the process of restoring forests that once existed is the natural solution. In simple words, planting more trees. We need to take up initiatives where we can, we all must take up planting trees. Uh, uh, it is said that uh, a single tree growing for around 50 years gives us enough oxygen for a family of around 4 to 5 individuals. Therefore, each of us has a responsibility to plant more trees. If each of us take up uh, initiative of planting at least 3 trees every year, 
we can definitely uh, take up this pro process of reforestation and reduce the impact of deforestation that has already taken place. I can give you one example of a photographer, a Brazilian couple by the name of Sebastião Salgado who was a wildlife photographer working in the uh, Amazon rainforests of Brazil. In 2001, when he visited the place uh, after moving to another area, he saw how the Amazon, were, the forests were cut down and lost. So he made it his mission in life along with his wife to replant the forest. And due to his initiatives, today if we see in, uh, in 2019, you can see the once desertified land is converted back again into lush green forest which houses several species of birds, mammals and reptiles and other organisms. Even in India, if you take the study of Abdul Karim, uh, a, a common layman like you and me in Kerala, uh, he replanted a huge patch of land which he bought with his own money to create a forest so that um, the impact of deforestation could be reduced. You can watch a film called as The Forest Man. It is a documentary film which has won several awards and it is based on the life of a man called Jadav Payang who is an inspirational environmental warrior who has uh, uh, converted the river, the, the banks of the river Brahmaputra to a reserve forest all by himself. You should watch movies like this. I have shared the link on my slide. It's called The Forest Man. It's an award winning documentary. If you watch this, you might be inspired and you may have a forest named after you very soon. This brings us to a little bit of history. This is about people's participation in conservation of forests. In, in 1731, this uh, uh, happened in the state of Rajasthan, in Jodhpur, Rajasthan. This is a time when kings were ruling over our country. And one of the kings from Jodhpur wanted some timber to build his palace. And so he sent his men into the forest and asked for timber to be brought, cut down the trees and get the trees for building purpose. Now at that time there was the Bishnoi tribe which was living in this area and one particular woman, uh, a Bishnoi woman by the name of Amrita Devi refused to let the king's men cut down her forest because they were the natives of that forest and what she did was she hugged the tree to death. That is, she told the king's man that you cannot cut the tree without, you cannot cut the tree because the tree is very precious to me. And she said that they should cut the tree along with her. And so it, it, uh, it, the story tells us that the king's man cut down the tree along with Amrita Devi. Inspired by this event, her three daughters and other women, Bishnoi women from the community began to hug the trees and avoid them from being cut. It is said that almost 363 Bishnoi women uh, uh, sacrificed their life. They made the ultimate sacrifice only to save the trees from their community. And this startled the men, the king's men who returned back to the palace and reported the incident and the cutting, further cutting down of trees in that area was stopped. In the recent times, the Chipko movement is very popular in our country. This is a movement uh, taken up by, again, women uh, in the Garhwal region of Himalayas. When certain trees were marked for cutting down in the Uttarakhand region of India, certain women of that area, the tribal women of that area refused to let these trees to be cut. Uh, their leader, uh, Gora Devi, was the part of the Chipko movement. She led the Chipko movement from the village and she uh, gathered women, other women from her community to come and hug the trees and to uh, prevent the uh, government from cutting down this forest. And today largely we know it as the Chipko movement where uh, women hug trees and save them from being cut. These are inspirational stories for you and me to take up initiatives like this and prevent deforestation. 
um, Dr. Ajit Kumar Banerjee is a person who gave us or who coined the term joint forest management in India. He's, according to his studies, he realized that if we do not give the responsibility of maintaining forests to the local communities, definitely the communities will exploit the forest. So he thought of having a joint management program with the local communities. What they did was they set up joint forest uh, management meetings and communities where the people living in the forest themselves were made in charge or made responsible for protecting the forest. First, education and awareness was given to these people on the use of conserving the forest. What you mean by conservation is they use the resource very responsibly in a sustainable manner, a manner in which they will also get what they need and the resource will be also conserved from the, for the generations to come. So the joint forest management allows the native people to use resources such as rubber, gums, medicinal resources, etc. from the forest while taking care of the forest themselves. The joint forest management is, is largely successful in protecting the forest as well as to get the resources from the forest and giving livelihood to, to these people who are dependent on the forest. What can we do to save trees? Plant at least three trees if you cut down one. I would say even if you have not cut down a single tree, please plant at least three trees to see that there is a reforestation that is done. Undertake afforestation programs in the school, in schools, colleges, we can celebrate Vanama Utsava. This should not be a one day program, but we should make it our mission to plant and take care of the trees so that uh, we can uh, participate in the afforestation program. Say no to indiscriminate cutting of trees. Follow examples. Uh, refer to green heroes of uh, India so that we can get inspired. Look at stories like Amrita Devi and Gaura Devi. There are even awards instituted in their names for people who show exemplary courage and determination to save the environment. Now we have looked at so many issues that have come to, that are, that are threatening our very own survival. What would you do to save the planet? You are now aware of the various problems that we are faced with. But what will you do? What is going to be your contribution from this burning earth to convert it into a greener and happier earth for the generations to come? I can give you a few suggestions. You have to devise and know your own methods, what each one of you can do. There are several simple things you can do to save the environment. Switch off uh, your computer when you are not using it. Switch to fluorescent bulbs which consume less, less power. Plant a tree. Clean up trash. Segregate the waste. Go for biodegradation. Go for recycling. Don't uh, increase the waste. Try to reduce the waste, carry your own shopping bag, cycle and walk instead of using uh, vehicles that are run on petrol and diesel. Take the stairs. When you use paper, use it optimally. Write on both sides of the paper. Do not just write a few scribbled notes and throw it into the trash bin. Save water. Do not pollute the water. Every drop is precious. Uh, turn off the lights if you are not using it. You don't just let power to be lost. Um, eat local, plant local and eat local uh, vegetables, etc. Uh, take shorter showers, do not waste water. Recycle, keep the bins in your homes, in your communities where we can segregate the waste at, at source. And these are some of the small things in our day-to-day -day life. If we change our habits, small things that we can do as uh, individuals of the global community in order to save the earth. I would want to add a very important thing. Today, 
we are living indoors. We are so stuck to the television, to our computer, to our phones, that we rarely go outside. We do not take natural, uh, natural uh, surroundings for entertainment purpose. We usually look at our phones or we look at uh, communities uh, within a virtual world for entertainment. I would suggest go out. Look at the environment around you. Take a walk in your surrounding. Uh, uh, organize biodiversity trails. Uh, use uh, field trips from your school as a family, as a uh, club, as, as a friend circle. Instead of hanging out at unwanted places, move into nature, study nature, observe nature, fall in love with nature. It is only then that you will develop a passion to save nature and you will also act responsibly. The greatest threat to our planet today is the belief that someone else will save it. I will say no. It is left up to you and me to save it. Because if we leave to someone else, it will never be done. I would like to end my class today with the same first saying that I started with. I said that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Let us come to this awareness that the world that we are living in today is borrowed from the generations to come. So do your bit. Live a healthier and happier world for the generations to come. You and I together need to take initiatives to heal the world and make it a better place for the generations to come. Thank you. Prudent Scholars Powered by Lupin Pharmaceuticals अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस